Yeah, a warm welcome to this uh, webinar on the pandemic of repression in Africa, the challenges to civil society. Thank you for joining. Um, this uh, webinar is uh, linked to work that we undertake here at Danish Institute for International Studies, um, linked to an uh, evaluation of official Danish assistance through civil society organizations, uh, particularly to, to Africa. My name is Lars Engberg Peterson. I'm head of the research unit on uh, sustainable development and governance. And um, we are here uh, today with uh, uh, some excellent speakers. And I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Nick Cheesman, professor of democracy at University of Birmingham, uh, who will make a presentation on, on um, democracy in Africa. Uh, he has written extensively on that subject. And um, subsequently, uh, Neil Webster, senior researcher at, at DIES, Danish Institute for International Studies, will uh, provide his comments. Uh, Neil has worked uh, his whole career on, on uh, civil society issues, on democracy uh, and uh, local government, in, in, uh, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. After Neil, we will turn to Mons Pedersen, a senior analyst at DIES, who has uh, passed as ambassador to um, a lot of countries in West Africa, in South Africa, in Southern Africa, and in East Africa. And he will provide his views on, on the civil society challenges in, in the region. And after him, we have the pleasure of uh, having uh, Sarah Brandt from um, the Danish network uh, of development NGOs, and she will uh, provide her comments to the debate. And after all that, we hope to have a good discussion and you are most welcome to provide your um, um, uh, questions uh, to, to the different panelists uh, in, and do so please in the Q&A box. Write in your um, questions there and then I will try to pick them out uh, and if there are many different questions I will try to pick uh, uh, some of them and, and get them into the discussion. So uh, a warm welcome and uh, I hope uh, that we can all look forward to a very good event here. Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thank you for this kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be able to talk to you today. Uh, I think this is an issue of great importance. And so my talk today is going to be entitled The Authoritarian Pandemic, Repressive and Democratic Implications of COVID-19. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's happened in the past 12 months, but I'm also gonna try and put that into a broader context for us by drawing on some of the lessons of my recent book with Oxford University Press, Authoritarian Africa, Repression, Resistance, and the Power of Ideas, which came out earlier this year. What's my argument gonna to be today? I'm gonna to make four key points in this presentation. The first is I'm going to suggest that colonial rule and the independence era that immediately followed it predisposed African states to a form of fragile authoritarianism. The aspiration of governments to achieve authoritarian control rarely being met with their capacity to establish it and to maintain stability for long periods of time. I'm going to talk about that as a way of providing context for the continuing struggles between democracy and authoritarianism we see in Africa and the continuing fragility we see of authoritarian regimes on the continent. I'll then move to talk about the implications for this of the current context. For example, the pandemic, which is said to have been led to a deterioration in democracy across the globe. Indeed, it's become almost a cliche now to refer to the authoritarian pandemic or the pan uh, repressive pandemic. And I'll suggest that that's true. We have seen a significant decline in democratic quality, not just in Africa, but around the world. But I'll also suggest that the pandemic isn't just impacting on democracies. And I'll argue that it's actually a multifaceted disruptive force that has a destabilizing potential for all regimes in sub-Saharan Africa, democratic or not. And I'll conclude then by pointing out that I suspect we'll see growing challenges to authoritarian systems in coming months, as we've seen, for example, over the last couple of weeks in Nigeria. So let me start. Why do we suggest that colonial rule in the immediate independence period predisposed Africa to a form of fragile authoritarianism in our book? 
Well, there are four key factors here, and I'll go through them fairly quickly, but I'm happy to pick up on any of them in the question and answer session if people are interested. The first is that, of course, colonial rule undermined existing checks and balances. Many African societies had been acephalous or stateless. They had operated in fairly small village units. Centralized states with great coercive capacity were fairly rare. They did exist, but in much of the continent, some people estimate as high as 80 or 90%, they were not a feature. Colonial rule eroded the checks and balances that existed in many of those societies. The fact that in many of those systems, chiefs or kings or whatever they were titled at the time, um, actually struggled to exert authority and that people could evade their authority by using migration and fleeing to other areas. And therefore there was a kind of delicate social balance, not something we could call a democracy, but not something that was straightforwardly authoritarian. And that was shattered by colonial rule. Colonial governments, of course, as we know, fostered big men deliberately, often as an attempt to divide and rule, and also as an attempt to rule countries with very small numbers of colonial officials. As a result, they deliberately invested in and fostered ethnic identities. Daniel Posner, for example, has written a brilliant book, which in part talks about how colonial governments deliberately trained Africans and connected them to their rural roots when they moved to urban areas as a way of trying to stop what they were afraid of, which was detribalization, by actually reinforcing ethnic identities and keeping Africans connected to chiefs living in rural areas. This process, of course, of reifying big men, of centralizing authority under them, of enforcing the importance of ethnic identities, went hand in hand with the construction of centralized bureaucracies. And of course, the colonial state itself was a highly hierarchical and authoritarian system. And the introduction of a lot of authoritarian legislation that prevented uh, for example, African citizens from having rights to assembly, um, civil liberties and so on. And many of the pieces of legislation, as we know, that are currently used by African governments have their roots in the colonial era. But colonial rule also exacerbated an existing center periphery divide at the same time as vesting great power in individuals in weakening the ability of other people to hold them to an account and strengthening the idea of ethnic politics. Colonial governments typically didn't invest in the sorts of state structures that would be necessary to sustain authoritarian rule after independence. There was a relatively small number of officials, a relatively lean state and an awful lot of relying on co-optation of individuals in order to maintain support. And that combination of a kind of overbearing state of big man rule of competition between communities and leaders for power and a relatively weak state when it comes to physical capacity and the ability to actually enforce control over our entire geographical territory, that is the interconnection or the, the uh, combination of factors that sets many countries in Africa up for a post-colonial period of relatively fragile authoritarianism, of governments that seek to assert control, but often fail to do so. So it's important to keep in mind that authoritarian African regimes, perhaps with the example of a small number of states, Rwanda today could be one, uh, have never been capable of the kind of totalitarian authoritarianism that we sometimes imagine, for example, in Europe or in the Soviet Union. And actually other factors have often played a critical role in the survival of authoritarian governments. One is extroversion i.e. the ability of governments to control their interaction with the global community, their ability to get aid, their ability to live off the rents from the sale of natural resources. And that's been critical to survival in many regimes and the ability of states to provide enough development in order to try and legitimate themselves. Ideas and symbolism has also been really important to many governments. Uh, President Museveni, one of Africa's longest leaders, longest serving leaders, one of the world's longest serving leaders, has of course consistently played on the idea that he is necessary to prevent a return to war, that he is the only one who can provide national unity. And that's an important legitimating device for the other strategies that he uses to remain in power, such as electoral manipulation and repression. 
So one of the things that we really bring out in the book Authoritarian Africa is that surviving as an authoritarian in the African context is complicated. You cannot simply rely on authoritarianism alone. You need to be able to operate through extroversion, through co-optation, and you need to be able to have ideas that symbolize your rule. And this is really important, I think, because it's going to be one of the things that I'm going to suggest is going to make African political systems that are more authoritarian vulnerable to the negative or destabilizing impact of COVID-19 as well. So what is happening under COVID-19? Well, we have had a process of democratic deterioration over the last year. According to Freedom House, here graphically represented by The Economist, 80 countries in the world have had a decline in the quality of democracy during COVID-19. Only one, Malawi, and we could talk about Malawi in the Q&A, has gone the other way and seen democracy got stronger on this measure. As you can see from the map, a lot of subtrees in sub-Saharan Africa and all of the countries in North Africa are seen to have had a period of democratic deterioration during COVID-19. So why is that the case? I think we often talk about this in the round and we don't disaggregate the processes that have led to this process of democratic uh, deterioration. So I'm going to break them down now into what I think are four particularly different processes. The first is that in a number of countries, we've seen straightforward power grabs. We've seen governments attempting to use COVID-19 and the need for emergency powers to expand their authority. This is perhaps most obviously the case, not in Africa, but actually in Hungary, where of course, Orban has taken on new emergency powers with no sunset clause. But it's also been a feature of a number of African countries where we see new powers being given to the security forces to enforce COVID deadlines and lockdowns where governments have often made decisions, refusing to engage with parliaments and so on. The second move is that of course, COVID-19 has generated considerable media attention and controversy in a number of countries. And in many places, we've seen governments respond by authoritarian measures such as censorship, intimidating journalists, and in at least six countries, physically beating journalists who are attempting to report on COVID-19 related stories. In countries like Tanzania, this has become routine, but it's also been something that's been reported in countries that we typically think of as being more democratic, such as Ghana. So this combination of governments manipulating COVID-19 for their own benefit, which includes, of course, saying that international observers can't come and observe elections in countries like Burundi, and the oppression, are clearly strategies in which authoritarian leaders are deliberately manipulating the context in order to secure more power. And I think there are two dynamics going on here. One, the context of COVID allows them to legitimate what they're doing internationally and domestically. But two, uh, to use a famous sort of phrase, it's become a good time to bury bad news. Many leaders know that the news cycle is completely congested with Trump and with COVID-19. The amount of attention you're gonna get in Guinea for rigging a constitutional referendum or a presidential election is significantly reduced now compared to perhaps two years ago. And so that perhaps is also an emboldening effect here on authoritarian leaders. The third fact, which I think is worth thinking about, isn't a deliberate strategy of authoritarian governments to take control. It's actually almost a kind of hidden effect that happens in democracies and non-democracies. And that is what I call the ratchet effect. It's the way in which during national crises and anti-terror operations and major health crises, uh, governments develop new systems of surveillance and new systems of tracking the population and monitoring the population that sometimes are not removed once the crisis is over. And so the capacity of the government to do that increases gradually over subsequent crises to the point where you realize that actually a significant amount of control has been transferred to the government without anybody actually explicitly making that decision. And finally, I think it's important to think about the impact of COVID-19 on trust and cooperation in multi-ethnic and diverse societies. We don't have a lot of evidence on this just yet. We haven't got new survey data or new anthropological research because of course, we're in the context of a pandemic. But if you look at the research on every previous health crisis that's similar to this one in terms of scale, the Black Death, for example, the Spanish flu, one of the main things that researchers comment on coming out of those crises is a deterioration in cooperation and trust between different groups. This is often said to be because pandemics force people back into their houses, they break down communication networks, 
Often minorities are stereotyped during pandemics as being vectors of the disease and demonized. And therefore, one of the things you often see is increased distrust between different communities as you move out of the pandemic. And economists and social psychologists have suggested, for example, that when it came to the Spanish flu, this distrust was so significant that it prevented communities cooperating over things like public goods and actually had a negative impact on economic growth in the years following. So I think one of the things we need to be conscious of here is that there's a risk that distrust and cooperation may be undermined. And then in countries like South Africa, this could trigger a new round of xenophobic violence. In other countries, it could lead to greater distrust between different ethnic minorities. In some ways, this all builds, of course, to something that looks like a perfect storm for democracy. We have governments that are emboldened to try and grab more power at a time when civil society groups are constrained by social distancing requirements and perhaps challenged by shifting social attitudes. And of course, it's important to say here that in many African countries, the most effective ways that civil society has been able to operate historically is by engaging with mass protests or engaging with people on the street. It's rarely been through social media itself. And therefore, of course, if a government bans mass rallies and mass meetings, as the Ugandan government has done in its current election campaign, the ability of civil society to hold government to account is significantly constrained. We have seen recently fantastic online movements, Zimbabwean Lives Matter, now Nigerian Lives Matter, and they've gained great traction online. But I think there's a really big question mark over whether authoritarian African governments that are not very sensitive to public opinion are going to be swayed by an online only campaign that does not have a physical uh, on the streets uh, equivalent. So when we look at it like this, it looks like a perfect storm for democracy in Africa and around the world. And it looks like we're going to be talking about further backsliding. But I think this is also in some ways leaving the story half told because I think there are two trends here and we focused a lot on the authoritarian one and we need to give a little bit of weight to the democratic one. So I'm just gonna end by saying a few things about this. On the left here, you see a picture from Zimbabwe, which is Zimbabwe's crackdown on dissidents and critics earlier this year. On the right, you see a poster from the current NSARS Now protests in Nigeria. And I put those two side by side because I want to suggest that actually what we're seeing is simultaneously authoritarian regimes being emboldened to try and grab more power and consolidate their authority, but also citizens who are increasingly frustrated by the economic decline that has occurred during the coronavirus crisis, trying to hold those governments accountable. And that counter trend actually means that authoritarian regimes are going to come into greater pressure as well. Why do I say that? Well, very early on in the coronavirus crisis, the number of demonstrations that were held around the world declined precipitously. And the reason it fell so quickly was, of course, because mass meetings were banned, public meetings were banned, everybody was supposed to be social distancing. And so if you look at what happens just after the 22nd of March, you can see a real decline in the number of protests. But what's really interesting is that by June, the number of protests around the world had increased to pre-pandemic levels. And I couldn't didn't have time to update this, but if you kept the graph going, you would see that the number of protests around the world are now higher than they were just before the pandemic. So we actually have more demonstrations now than we did before. And some of those demonstrations, or many of them, have been in sub-Saharan Africa. This is data from the ACLED data set, by the way. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that for every Hungary, where we saw the power grab, we saw Belarus with people on the streets refusing to accept a rigged election. For every Zimbabwe, where the government is cracked down, we have a Nigeria, where we have thousands of people on the streets of Lagos. For every Philippines, we have a Thailand, where young people are laying a plaque saying that they want to have democracy rather than royal law. And for every Turkey, we have a Kazakhstan, where a president of 30 years has recently been forced to step down. And so I think we really need to ask a question question about is coronavirus bad for democracy or is it simply challenging to political stability? Here are four quick reasons why I think that uh, coronavirus will undermine the rule of authoritarian governments in Africa as well as democracies in the next few months and then I'll finish. First of all, I think it was going to be a significant economic collapse in many countries. Even governments like those in Nigeria, Kenya and South Africa that were able to provide significant COVID relief funds weren't able to fully 
prevent people from feeling the brunt of coronavirus. And those relief funds have generally ended or will be phased out in the next month or so. So we're entering a period in which people will still suffer the same COVID impact on the economy, but with none of the government protection that they enjoyed previously. Second, many countries in Africa, most obviously countries like Ghana and Zambia, but other countries like Kenya, not that far behind, have unsustainable levels of debt. And that debt has been significantly increased during the coronavirus crisis because governments have spent more money on things like healthcare and they've generated less revenues. And even though the IMF and the World Bank have allowed countries to suspend payments, many governments have refused to take that offer because it came with restrictions. And so we see a number of countries that are likely to be forced to cut government spending as a way of balancing the books over the next 12 months, exacerbating the impact of economic collapse. I think these two things are particularly significant in the context of coronavirus, because I think that the virus has also really made people focus on the poor provision of public services. And I think in many countries, people are reflecting on the government's inability to provide effective health care, not just during the coronavirus, but to invest in it and make it an effective system of government over a long period of time. And that's increased the focus on governments who are either you know, on the one hand providing no services or on the other hand are actually abusing their states and the number of protests we've seen against police brutality, not just in Nigeria, but in Kenya and other countries has increased during the coronavirus. And this is particularly true in countries where we've seen significant corruption scandals related to COVID-19 funds. And so far, I've seen significant corruption allegations around the use of COVID-19 funds in about half of all African countries. Significant accusations in countries like Zimbabwe and Kenya, where it's alleged that either contracts were given out at inflated prices with kickbacks going back to government officials, or where it suggested that contracts went to companies associated with ruling party figures who didn't have the expertise to provide the equipment they were being paid for. And I think when you put these four things together, the economic collapse, the debt crisis to come, criticism of government services and corruption scandals, that's where you start to see the mass protests and the frustration. It's that combination of things in countries like Belarus that is driving protests as well as the rigged election. It's this combination of things that is driving popular frustration in Nigeria. And my suspicion is that over the next 12 to 24 months, we will see a similar combination of factors radicalize and mobilize people in other or authoritarian states. Of course, all of this and how this plays out on a country by country basis will be mediated by a bunch of factors. And I won't go through this now because I don't have time, but if anyone wants to talk about individual cases and how they play out, of course, we need to think about the international context that country's in. We need to think about the structure of that economy. Does it have oil and gas or is it dependent on uh, stronger trade unions, which it needs to negotiate with? We need to talk about regime capacity and what is the ability of the regime to actually use force to survive. Uh, we need to talk about the relative balance between unity and the government and the opposition. So all all of the trends I'm talking about will play out differently in different African countries, depending on how these four factors play out. And we can talk about this more in the Q&A if people are interested in the specific countries that we might want to look at. But for now, just to end, I want to highlight two reasons why I'm a little worried about what the future will bring. Um, the first is that I think we've seen sort of international complicity in some ways in some of the trends of weakening democracy that we're talking about. In the United States, we have a president that has downgraded democracy promotion. And in the United Kingdom, we have a prime minister that is focused on Brexit and not on the rest of the world. But to focus on Boris Johnson and President Trump would also be to forget or ignore the fact that commitment and investment in democracy promotion in those two countries is a longer term trend and predates those two leaders. And I think there's a growing sense in a number of African countries countries that the international community is not going to be riding in to save democracy either financially or in terms of pressure. And I think that's a significant concern moving forwards. I think the second thing that we need to be worried about is that there's also a longer term trend in terms of support for democracy. Recent research by the University of Cambridge told us that support for democracy has been falling in recent years. Globally, over the last 10 years, support for democracy has fallen so dissatisfaction of democracy has risen from 47% to 57%. So dissatisfaction of democracy, 47% to 57% after having increased prior to that. And if we look in sub-Saharan Africa, we can see this process happening there as well. 
So the support for democracy, the number of people who prefer democracy to any other system, as you can see here, has fallen significantly over the last five years. It previously was at 71%. It's now much lower than that. I don't think that means that people in Africa are necessarily ready to turn their backs on democracy or that they necessarily think an authoritarian alternative would be better for them. But I think it does tell us that the fact that many people live in systems where they believe that elections are manipulated and don't lead to changes of power, where they've suffered considerable economic hardship and where they're currently struggling to see how their democratic governments are being effective, has eroded the sort of support for democracy that we saw before. During the 1990s and the 2000s, what we typically saw in the Afrobarometer was relatively consistent support for democracy and many people saying that democracy wasn't working effectively, but we are patient. What we're starting to see is that patients wear out and people starting to have less confidence that democracy is a system for them. And I think perhaps one thing that the international community, at least those that I come into contact with and the academic community, have not worked on or acted on or engaged with enough is the fact that in some ways I think we're losing the ideological battle if we want to promote democracy. I think there's an increasing number of African elites who challenge the idea that democracy is the best system for their government and there's an increasing number of African intellectuals that will do the same and I think in many ways the rise of China and the perceived success of Rwanda have been the two kind of empirical examples that have grounded that. But now with the collapse of the United States and the way that US democracy looks, with falling amounts of research is probably being invested in democracy promotion in the next 10 years, and with Trump being willing to shake hands with figures like Erdogan in Turkey, I think there's a really serious question about where the rhetorical debate about democracy versus authoritarianism goes in the next five to 10 years. And I think for these two reasons, we need to be worried. So a quick summary of what I've said. Yes, democracy in Africa is in decline. Yes, these challenges are likely to intensify, but I think it's also really important to keep in mind that authoritarian regimes are also coming under great strain. And therefore, perhaps it's best to think of the pandemic not simply as an authoritarian move or driver, but as a broader driver of political stability. And perhaps we will see that being the key message that will come out of the next few months. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. This was excellent, uh, very broad uh, expose on, on uh, these issues. So thank you very much. Um, now I will turn to Neil Webster, uh, who will provide his comments to, to this presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, that was a very broad sweep. Um, and I suppose if I was to answer or put one position, I think I would take a more optimistic view. So I will take the uh, optimistic view on uh, democracy but <clears throat> in Africa, but let me come to that. Um, I think we're about to witness a series of development experiences in Africa that will actually transform both global politics and more importantly, national and local politics on the ground for, for millions in sub-Saharan Africa. But I may be proved wrong. Uh, my thoughts are very much influenced by some ongoing research we're doing, looking at the role of governance with respect to climate change adaptation and mobility practices, specifically in Ethiopia and Ghana, but also many interactions I've had with researchers and research in, in various sub-Saharan countries, and also a little bit as a practitioner. I mean, for me, talking about economic development, then we have to look at the state of governance. If we're talking about inequality in such countries, again, we have to look at the state of governance. If we're talking about COVID-19 and the responses, again, it's looking at the, the state of governance. And of course, human rights, civil liberties, legal protection, uh, these are in, often indicators of the state of governance, the, the actual condition of democracy and civil society. Now, are we seeing repression growing? Are we seeing COVID intensifying the, shall we say, challenge to democracy in, in Africa? Is there a shrinking space for civil society? I'm not so certain, actually, if that's, that's the correct, shall we say, perspective to have over this, this time period. Uh, I know things do not look good. Just look at what happened in uh, Lagos yesterday. Uh, if we look at Ethiopia, political rights in Rwanda, 
democratic failure in Eritrea, we do have many, many uh, challenges. But how did we get here and what is going on? What might we do to try and, should we say, strengthen the democratic trend, as you call it? And this leads me to an underlying question as a starting point. Can one have democracy without a middle class, primarily urban? That's a middle class that wants to be heard, wants services for their families, wants the right to organize a free media and much more. Now, where the middle class is not numerically strong and lacks political voice, can democracy flourish? Um, can authoritarian tendencies be held back or pushed back? Now, from what I can see in the early decades of independence, perhaps many researchers and, and development actors, players, actually believed it was possible to have democracy basically without any, uh, shall we say, substantial urban middle class at all. These were primarily agrarian economies, but the reality on the ground, the, the lack of a middle class outside the state bureaucracy became accepted as an increasingly important reason for why other governance paths came to be followed. Now, if we add to that context, the nature of the state that came out of colonialism, this um, post-colonial state, and here I'm thinking about many writers who looked into this and pointed to its overdeveloped nature, the bureaucratic military oligarchy, as many writers called it, both writing about South Asia, but also in, in Africa, uh, John Saul, Colin Lees, etc. That is a very important factor. Now, it was obviously there in the 60s and 70s. But if we jump several decades to the present, could it be that a middle class has begun to emerge, educated, urban, with their horizons extended by travel, by social media, and much more? And this emerging middle class, often young, runs increasingly in many ways into the kind of established buffers of this military bureaucratic oligarchy or the remnants of that, that is in part of a political settlement with political elites and emerging economic elites. So that's to say we're not really seeing democracy in retreat or declining we're seeing authoritarianism having a continuity all the way through, but an emerging pressure as we see the beginnings of a, of a transformation, not least of the economies of these countries. So change, but no change, you could summarize it. Um, I would also uh, question the role of outsiders <laughs> in this. Uh, should we be running checklists? I'm being a little bit polemical here. Should we be running checklists for democratic conditions, ticking off boxes for corruption, for media free freedom, raising questions on human rights, on the condition and treatment of civil society, etc., when it is possibly at the expense of economic development? Or to put it another way, what's the basis for our concern with authoritarianism at this point in time? I think of a very good film I saw recently on Ethiopia, Dead Donkeys Fear No Hyenas, which was about pastoralists being moved off uh, their lands to make way for um, large scale commercial cultivation of basmati rice. And here you have the dilemma. Do you take the, should we say, the basic indicators we would use for democracy, such as human rights, et cetera, et cetera, and raise those to a higher level than the needs of the economy as a whole? to the interests of the nation as a whole, commercial agriculture, cheap food, uh, uh, self-sufficiency in electricity, et cetera. And this brings me to obviously the discussion about the, the role and nature of the developmental state. I think in your book, uh, um, Nick, you talk about developmental authoritarianism. Is this once again present in the discussions of success and failure in Africa? Now, if we take Ethiopia and Rwanda, now they're both very strong um, states, economic success stories, but at the cost of democracy. In agrarian Ethiopia, and Ethiopia is primarily agrarian in terms of population numbers, although it's got high economic growth, there is still subsistence farming, pastoralism. Should that be given precedence over exchange earnings, low food prices in rapidly growing urban centers and self-sufficiency in electricity? I don't have a clear answer 
but I see from history that economic development does have political costs for individuals and localities. And if we elevate, not least as outsiders, the importance of some of these indicators, and I'm being very polemical here, uh, are we not perhaps taking a kind of short-termism in our approach towards looking at developing these countries at the expense of a longer-term strategy, at the expense of a longer-term economic development, um, at the expense of building strong foundations for a democratic future? This leads me to another question, actually, which is about the nature of representation and the form of authorization that those in national and also local government, I work a lot with local government, consciously or subconsciously claim. When representation is more symbolic than substantive, i.e. representatives stand for particular groups rather than act for them as such, then a country and its people have problems. And to some extent, this may be part of what we're witnessing in terms of the, the protests and the, the civil disturbances taking place in a number of African countries, that it's a reaction to the failure of representation. Identity politics, they generate exclusion and marginalization by definition. Societies are divided, citizens played off against each other. And in such situations, democratic practices, such as elections, party organization, civil, civil society organizations as well, can't they become co-opted into the service authoritarian political leaders if we're not careful? So blithely pushing for more democracy or arguing for the merits of symbols of democracy, if I want to be really controversial, for governance reforms, et cetera, can in reality reinforce the very tendencies that such measures are intended to oppose. So you end up getting more misuse of resources, cronyism, discrimination on the basis of social and cultural identities, judicial failings, human rights abuses, et cetera. Now, why do I have room for optimism? I could carry on on the pessimist side, but why do I have room for optimism as I indicated at the outset? Now, I know that civil society is the focus here, but I would actually want to push one other area as well and suggest that authoritarian trends and tendencies can be challenged by promoting decentralized government with a genuine devolution. This is involving fiscal decentralization and et cetera, responsibilities and fields of education, health, not least managing COVID-19. And it's interesting that we're beginning to see that managing COVID-19 where the local is engaged, not least in the United Kingdom where you are, uh, can actually bring about maybe a better, uh, shall we say, coping with that uh, pandemic at the moment. Also pursuing greater accountability to local populations, because when you're at the lo local level of government, you're at the interface between citizen and state. And this can be very positive in terms of, shall we say, strengthening accountability, not least downward accountability. And of course, authoritarian, authoritarian rule find it very hard to accept such decentralization. It can weaken the absolute nature of such governments. Uh, it can weaken the identity politics behind uh, authoritarian ruin. It can weaken the control over resources that maintain big men at all levels, and I'm being told to hurry up. Um, but I would also argue that it is here that the interface between civil society and local government and citizen can actually begin to play a major role. And I would argue if you don't begin to build up those types of institutional mechanisms and instruments, then social movements in themselves will not be built about, will not bring about sustainable democratic change. Um, so yes, there I would say over to Mons, who is going to take up the civil society <laughs> issue. Thanks a lot, Neil. Great. Um, yes, Mons, could you unmute and get on the, with your presentation? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay, I will focus my my short presentation on how uh, how is civic uh, space shrinking in Africa under increasingly repressive regimes. The general trend in Africa is towards a more closed civic space, 
According to Civicus, the International Association of Civil Society Organizations, 41 countries are, are out of 49 in Sub-Saharan are systematically curtailing civic freedoms. Freedom House is coming to similar conclusions. In these countries, CSOs are limited in their role as political actor in a democratic society. It's very difficult for CSO to engage in advocacy, anti-corruption issues, governance issue, and increasingly also in issues around natural resources, in particular land issues. Many governments in Africa would like to see CSOs concentrating on service delivery activities, development project, or in particular humanitarian assistance. But we see different patterns of shrinking space depending on the political context and the nature of the repressive regimes. Let us take as examples these Sahel countries, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. The political development and the civic space are very much reflecting the rapidly increasing armed conflict and terrorist attack during the last eight years. In all three countries, laws have been adopted, limiting the access of CSOs and in particular human rights organization to information on what is by far the main issues or main issue on the national agenda, the armed conflict and the massive violation of human rights related to the terrorist attack, but also often very violent behavior of the national army. In Burkina, for instance, a new legal code has recently been approved, limiting information on a conflict and several meetings organized by human rights organization on the conflict and security have been banned. In East Africa, we have seen a general tendency towards shrinking space during recent years. In Tanzania, the process has been accelerated during the last five to seven years reflecting the intention of CCM, the traditional government party, to continue to dominate the political scene. During the ongoing electoral campaign, we have seen several media being closed down and members of opposition and human rights organization arrested. CCM seems more and more to behave as if it was, a leading, was leading a one party system or it's coming up from the liberation movement. In Uganda, the process has been more gradual and is very much related to the ambitions of President Museveni and the group around him to stay in power. In particular, the change of constitution in 2017, which permitted President Museveni to run for another term. A large range of measures limits significantly CSO activities, introduction of new restrictive NGO laws and frequent intervention of security forces to stop CSO activities, such as peaceful meetings and they are daily practice. Also, we have seen burglary into CSO and in particular human rights organization, which afterwards never are clarified. I think that this development reflects increasing collusion, which is not a particular Uganda, between the political and in the economic uh, elite. And part of this elite is increasing the members of the army. The second issue I want to talk about is how are African governments limiting this civic space? What are the different instruments employed by the government to crack down on civil society? I will just mention a few here. The digital control, increasing online control as surveillance. The development and rise of digital technology, online communication and social media has been a new and powerful instrument for civil society to organize, to organize both online and offline and share ideas. But it's also an instrument for repressive government to increase control of civic society. With more and more sophisticated technology, often Chinese, the possibilities to survey, 
and control increase. Shutting down access to internet during the election is frequent. Tax on some of the online media is another measure that we have seen, for instance, in East Africa countries like Tanzania and Uganda. In general, the internet is increasingly, increasingly a battlefield between civil society and authoritarian governments. Secondly, legal, legal means many governments are using a number of laws to restrict the activities of civil society organizations. Examples are tax laws, defamation laws, and counter-terrorism laws. In particular, counter-terrorism laws have restricted civil society and human rights defenders' activity. According to the UN Special Rapporteur on Promotion and Protection of Human Rights while countering terrorism, in the name of combating terrorism and protecting national sovereignty, these laws often constitute a major attack on civil society and human rights defenders. This development started with 9-11, but today it continues to play an important role in several African countries, like for instance in Kenya. There is a number of other legal measures which, for instance, aim at restricting foreign funding that CSO can receive and introduce new registration of CSOs. Thirdly, I want to mention another area where many of these authoritarian governments are, are active, and namely the administrative measures. A large number of very different, more administrative measures are increasingly being used to restrict civil society in Africa, very often pretending to promote transparency, government authorities make office inspection of CSO, revision of accounts and inspection of foreign support. If something is not clear, it may be a pretext for closing down the office or limiting the CSO activities. I also want to mention, and then I'm coming to the, uh, I think I have passed maybe the time limit, what I call harassment and crude violence. We have seen an increase, significant increase in the use of violence against civil society organization during recent years by authoritarian regimes in African countries, in part particular during elections. Some, some observers even talk about a, a tendency to militarization in several African countries. Many public meetings have been attacked by the security forces. For many repressive regimes, the security force are becoming an increasingly important ally in many African countries, like in Uganda. To justify um, the government or the government's intervention against civil society, we often hear African leaders coming forward on various issues like human rights is something uh, coming from Western countries, multi-party democracy is not appropriate or against African culture, or first we have to see economic progress before we can introduce democracy, the so-called Asian model, are some of the pronouncements we hear from many African countries, for instance, from Museveni or Kagame. Fine, I have a final comment and maybe a question. And I, I think the question is addressed to Professor Cheesman. While we have, we may not have any vaccine combating the pandemic of repression in Africa and the increasingly thinking space for civil society, we may have other drivers of change coming forward. During the last five years, we have seen several broad social and political movements on the continent, leading to regime change, like in Burkina Faso in 14, 2014 and 15, Gambia two years later, and more recently in, in Sudan. At the same time, several observers talk about a new wave of political and social activism of young people organized in informal groups and 
organizing specific action often target, targeted specific issues like anti-corruption. Many of these young people don't want to engage in more traditional CSOs or NGO activities. So my question, which is rather general, is what will be the main drivers of social and political change in African countries in the years to come? Thank you. Thank you, Mons. That was very fine. We go on to uh, Sara. If you um, can connect. Yes, thank you very much. Can you see my screen now? Yes, it's fine. Great. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Sarah Brandt and I work for Global Focus, which is the Danish um, NGO platform for organizations working globally on development, humanitarian and human rights projects. And our members work with civil society around the world um, and are very diverse in, in the projects and the, the sizes and, and also the focus of their work. But um, this issue of uh, civic space certainly is something that um, joins uh, every single member that we have because what they're experiencing is that their members around the world are, and, and their partners in local civil society are um, beginning to have difficulties carrying out their work. And what's important to notice is that really almost every single member that we have that you can see here on the screen, whether they work on children's rights, um, gender equality or other issues, every single one of them have in some way experienced how it is becoming increasingly difficult to work on um, these issues and, and especially as civil society actors. And I think Mons has just given us a really great insight into the situation and we've also heard how um, COVID has certainly not improved the situation but rather worsened it. And so what I'd like to do today is to speak a little bit about what civil society has done to try to counter these civic space restrictions that we've been facing in general, but also with regards to COVID-19. So uh, one uh, very important work that civil society does is to track the restrictions that we're facing. So this is a, a world map of, uh, the, that is from the Civicus Monitor. And basically it looks at the situation on civic space in a country. And the definition of civic space is to be looking at freedoms of expression, freedoms of association and freedoms of assembly. And these uh, freedoms obviously are central to be able to practice um, any uh, engagement in society and certainly to, to uh, be part of, of, of democracy and, and have your democratic fundamental freedoms. So this is the definition that is used here. And what is special about the Civicus Monitor is that the data going into the monitor is derived from local civil society organizations around the world. And so it's important to note that these are organizations observing and monitoring the situation in um, their national context. And some are also regional organizations that have a broader reach. Um, again, we also have a Freedom Houses uh, monitor. We also have um, International uh, Center for Non-for-Profit Law. Um, that also has really good tracking um, monitors. And what I just want to say, if we look at this map, is that as you can see, there are quite a few red countries, which means that they're entirely closed for civil society. And um, actually, the latest numbers from Civicus shows that it is only 3% of the world's uh, population that lives in democratic countries. And, and here I mean they're able to practice fully the, the democratic freedoms uh, of those three um, human rights that I just mentioned. And so for this reason, if you look at one of the red countries, the only way for civil society to work is to work underground if you live in a red country, um, to be very, very careful because you are so, um, so subject to surveillance, et cetera, from the government and risk being imprisoned or even worse if you speak out. And um, then uh, what I also want to say, and I think this is really important to stress is that 
whenever civic space closes in a context, civil society is not able to go on with their normal work. This means that whenever governments make legal or, um, or practical restrictions against civil society actors, we are forced to then instead focus on having our friends released from prison, um, trying to reverse a law that is restrictive, et cetera, which means that the traditional civic, civil society work is not able to, to be in the forefront of the work that we do. So governments are succeeding in closing down our focus on what we normally focus on because they don't want civil societies to speak truth to power oftentimes. And uh, what we see is also that there are also a lot of organizations emerging that are focusing specifically on civic space. For example, in East Africa, we have Defend Defenders, which is a regional organization supporting human rights defenders at risk. We have Civicus Frontline Defenders, Urgent Action Fund Africa and others. And so um, we collaborate closely with a lot of these organizations. But also what I just want to say, which is a central principle for us as civil society is that we really need to work very closely with those that are experiencing the attacks locally. So this means that for us as Global Focus, whenever we make campaigns, recommendations, et cetera, it's very important for our members that they include their partners around the world because they know that they're the ones that really know what needs to happen and how civic space um, is being restricted, but also what measures need to be taken. So using this uh, saying of nothing about us without us, I think is a very good uh, line, at least for us to go by. And so of course, next time we have a webinar in Africa, I hope we have someone from uh, an African country as well as a speaker, but uh, we will leave that up to next time. But um, if we go on, I just want to quickly touch on a campaign that we had um, together with our members focusing on the issue of COVID-19, restricting civic space even further. Our members gathered um, uh, examples from uh, their partners from around the world that really highlighted the increase in attacks. And this fortunately led to a lot of action from the Danish government. We saw that they um, decided to um, provide specific funding to um, support civil society at risk due to attacks on COVID-19. And we have also seen that they've made really good statements in, at the UN Human Rights Council sessions um, etc. And recently we saw that uh, the Danish foreign ministry just announced that the new foreign policy will be focusing on democracy and human rights. And so we're of course very happy for that. And what I just wanted to quickly also touch upon is the rapid response networks that we have as civil society that are really central to be able to support our colleagues around the world that are in danger. So basically when attacks on civil society occur, whether it being um, attacks at an office, um, physical attacks in the street, or maybe even uh, imprisonment or legal restrictions that make it difficult to continue operating as an organization, we see that rapid response funding is important either for emergency relief so that if a person is in danger, they can maybe move to another part of their region uh, um, or, or another part in the country. If a person is in danger or an office, uh, maybe they can put up surveillance cameras, et cetera, that we can support funding or they could receive rapid response funding for advocacy and campaigning um, activities that could really work to restrict the attacks they're facing, whether them being legal or otherwise. And so rapid response networks, uh, they fortunately do exist already around the world, but um, there's not enough, and especially with the rapid de decline in civic space around the world. And so for that reason, we're very happy to, to announce that um, Global Focus will be now able to support um, human rights defenders and those working with Danish partners um, through rapid response funding that, uh, that we're collaborating with the Danish government on. And so members of Global Focus have been pushing for this for a long time. So luckily this will now be part of Danish development aid going forward. And uh, VUCA Alliance is another um, 
network of organizations from all over the world coming together to support each other through advocacy and global responses and campaigns whenever something is going wrong in a country. So we're part of VUCA, but also I want to encourage anyone who's interested to, to uh, keep an eye out for the good work that, that they're doing. And um, just very quickly, I want to touch on the importance of the multilateral institution when it comes to the fight for civic space. So civil society is obviously very active um, at the UN. Unfortunately, there has also been a situation where civil society has been excluded a bit. And especially during COVID when, when the, uh, when the UN meetings have gone virtual, we've seen an issue of civil society potentially being muted, <laughs> uh, literally, or that civil society wasn't able to take part in all of the different discussions. And so since many governments around the world are closing down completely civic space, the only mechanisms that we have to call out these governments is at the UN. And that's also why it's good to see that Denmark is taking leadership on this. And we, we would hope that they would continue with that, but of course also encourage other governments to do it. And so as civil society, uh, we continue to, to try and work in these spaces and also to, to continue to demand inclusion of civil society at, at the UN. Um, and I just want to briefly uh, touch upon uh, some of our next steps. What we're planning to do is to, among Danish civil society, um, set up sub country groups to basically focus on uh, the cases that arise in those countries where Danish organizations are most active. So that could, for example, be Uganda, Tanzania or others where um, Danish organizations have a lot of partners that really um, feed in worrying information and we, where we can see a civil society, we need to stand together and see how we can be part of supporting our partners and colleagues in those countries. So I think I'll leave it at that. And thanks again. Thank you very much, Sarah, for summarizing some of the civil society responses to the changing situations in, in uh, several countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you very much. I should uh, just uh, repeat that um, if you have a question uh, as a participant um, to this webinar, you can uh, move the mouse over the screen and then you will see uh, um, a possibility for ticking a Q&A box at the bottom. And there in that box, you will be able to uh, write a question and I will try to convey that to, um, to the panelists. But while you do that, um, I will just start out by saying that, that uh, Nick, I think you should have a chance to respond to some of these um, issues that have been uh, raised. And I think that in particular, um, there is something about what is this democracy <laughs> and, and um, um, because uh, I guess that, that uh, both Moans and, and Neil um, touch upon this, uh, that, that there are also many other um, tendencies uh, currently in some countries and there's a lot of uh, popular mobilization. Uh, and is that also a part of, of what we see? You mentioned yourself that there are different uh, tendencies going both uh, in, in a, a tendency of, of, of um, stronger repression during uh, Corona, but also um, some undermining of, of uh, political stability and also authoritarian regimes. So, so um, to me, there's an, an important issue here about uh, what we are actually uh, talking about and when we say that there is a tendency uh, when, with respect to, to less democracy. But uh, please feel free to, Nick, to respond to whatever you think is important uh, to raise. Um, the floor is yours, and then I'll look at the questions meanwhile. Uh, need to. Um... Thanks to everyone and uh, thanks for all the fascinating comments. I think a couple of points maybe that, that draw things together. Um, Mogis was asking an interesting question about, you know, what's the big social drivers? What's going to happen in terms of social change and how that's going to connect to political changes? And I think Neil touched on that as well when he talked about the role of the middle class, which, of course, since Barrington Moore has been something that we thought would be, you know, it's important for the driving of democracy. Um, and I agree. I mean, I think longer term, 
stronger democracies across sub-Saharan Africa will resolve as much from social changes as they will from anything that's done by the international community or you know that's done in other parts of the political system and obviously you know we might point at the rise of the middle class Morgan's asked about what drivers I see as being really important in the future I think urbanization is perhaps the most important factor we're moving from a continent that was predominantly rural to a continent that will be predominantly urban and one of the things we know about urbanites in Africa is they are much more likely to vote for the opposition than those who live in rural areas. They're more voracious consumers, of course, of news and information. And typically they try to do more to hold their governments to account. So if we see a big expansion of urban areas, it's going to be difficult for governments to hold power in the way that they did in the past, which is often by co-opting traditional leaders and dominating the vote in rural parts of the country and then sort of under delivering in urban areas that that strategy isn't going to work anymore. They're going to have to appeal to urban voters as well. And that need to appeal to urban voters is going to shift the balance of power within societies. So I think that process of urbanization, as well as the rise of the middle class, will drive in the longer term a process of of democratization and I think what we're talking about here in a sense is two trends at the same time we're seeing greater protest from below as people demand their democratic rights at the same time as governments are trying to repress that using the system of repression that they've got established and so I think it's perfectly consistent that we see at the same time kind of greater top-down repression and in some ways greater promise of democracy from the bottom up I think those two trends are consistent with each other and of course what we're talking about when we're talking about a decline in democracy is not a decline in democratic activism by the population but an increasing use of certain strategies by the ruling party to manage that activism by the population. So I think it's important to say that when we're talking about the decline in democracy we're talking about key indicators as indeed the speakers on civil society have said, it's very clear that across the board there has been a clamping down on civil liberties and we can measure that quite effectively across countries. I think the other thing that's really important to say though is that some of those positive trends will be hampered by COVID-19. So the rise of the middle class, which is very fragile and not as big as people imagine it to be in many countries in Africa, is gonna be undermined by COVID-19. Many of the middle class have lost their livelihoods as a result of this economic collapse. If Africa sees a period of economic stagnation due to COVID-19, that will set back the emergence of this middle class that is able to do more to hold the government to account. And so I think we have to keep in mind that although these broader socioeconomic trends are positive, the impact of the virus may well have a significant knock-on effect on them as well. The final thing I would like to say is that, you know, why does it matter? Why are we invested in the idea that democracy might be important? Why do we care about this democratic upsurge of popular feeling and the repression coming from governments? I mean, essentially, because all of the evidence tells us that democracies do better economically in sub-Saharan Africa. There are states in Asia that did very well as authoritarian states in terms of development, South Korea, most obviously China today. That's not true of Africa. Africa tried its kind of developmental authoritarian phase in the 70s and 80s and almost all of those states failed when it came to the economy. The best performing states economically in Africa from 1960 to 1990 were Botswana and Mauritius, two democracies. All of the analysis that's done cross-national analysis of all states in Africa shows us that African democracies perform better when it comes to economic growth than African authoritarian states. And basically what we have is a fairly straightforward pattern. We have a couple of authoritarian states that look particularly good when it comes to economic growth essentially Rwanda and Ethiopia. But if you look at all the other authoritarian states, they're performing really badly. So the democratic states are not performing quite as well as Rwanda on economic growth. But if you look at the average, they're performing at a much higher level than the average authoritarian states. So if you could have every African state being Rwanda when it came to development, that might be a good trade-off from democracy to development. But that trade-off doesn't work in every single other African state. And I think we could also agree there are other reasons why we wouldn't want to impose the Rwandan model on all of the countries. So I think even when it comes to actually good governance, even when it comes to development, even when it comes to providing basic public services, there are good reasons for thinking that we should actually be supporting democracies. And as I say, this is not an effect we see globally. It's an effect we see in sub-Saharan Africa. Authoritarian regimes in Africa seem to be particularly bad for certain aspects of state development, uh, state capacity, 
and economic development. In fact, we have a new paper coming out that shows that in the same decade when state capacity and authoritarian regimes in Asia increased and in Latin America increased, in Africa it flatlined. So we have no evidence that authoritarianism actually works really well for development in Africa and therefore no reason to sacrifice human rights in favor of development. Thanks a lot. Nick, could you just uh, expand a little bit on that point? Because uh, I think it's very interesting that, that there is this difference. And can you say anything about whether it's just a matter of geography, uh, African versus Asia, or, or do you see particular factors explaining this difference between the countries? I mean, if you look at the sort of classic literature, people like Coley and others on kind of where state-led development works and where it doesn't work, there's a set of things that you normally think you need to make it work particularly well. One is often a kind of external threat that focuses the mind of the political elite on achieving long-term economic growth, because of course you need to make short-term sacrifices to achieve that long-term growth. Another is the ability to perhaps insulate at least part of your civil service from kind of ethnic ties and patrimonial ties in order to regulate corruption and make sure that decisions are made in productive ways. And another is perhaps a kind of degree of political stability and ability to keep trade unions under control. Um, and of course, if you were then to think about, you know, an African country that had had a history of more patrimonial governance, dividing rule politics and winner takes all politics in which leaders are expected to serve their communities first, leading away from public goods, where bureaucracies have often been had, you know, significant problems with uh, personal rules and personal networks, you know, trumping the official rules and with corruption distorting um, the use of resources. And you also think about the kind of limited focus of African elites on long-term economic growth, often a prioritization of immediate kind of um, consumption needs. Um, you know, for example, people moving money out of the country into Swiss bank accounts rather than reinvesting it in the economy. If you put all of that together, I think what you see is that in the African context, the risk of authoritarianism is it simply removes the checks and balances on leaders and therefore they operate even worse than they would under another context. Mm -hmm. And what you don't get is the benefit of authoritarianism in, say, China, which is the ability to do long term planning and really keep focused on that long term goal. So you seem to get the worst of authoritarianism and without the best of authoritarianism. And I think that's because of the nature of the state as it's evolved in Africa and the fact that it's very difficult. And I think the Rwandan example is a really good way of looking at this, right? In Rwanda, Paul Kagame has managed to prevent those kinds of problems from emerging in his authoritarian state. But he's done it essentially by establishing an incredibly tight level of top-down control that is deeply authoritarian and doesn't allow opposition parties to get more than 2% in general elections and doesn't allow any real criticism. Now, if you can establish a state like that, you can establish top-down control over rents and corruption. You can make sure that profits that are generated from the system to the ruling party are reinvested in the economy. Mm -hmm. And therefore you can make a fairly corrupt authoritarian regime productive and have high levels of economic growth. But could you get that level of centralized control in Nigeria? with three ethnic, main ethnic groups and different religions and multiple parties. In Kenya, with five competing ethnic groups of more than 15% of the population. In even, um, you know, someone like the DRC. I mean, it's kind of inconceivable in most countries that you can actually establish that level of authoritarian top-down control. And so I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that if Rwanda is our only example of a really successful authoritarian state, and the Rwandan model looks like it can't be replicated in most other countries, then probably what we're saying is that actually authoritarianism is not going to be a pathway to economic growth in Africa. Thanks a lot. Um, this shouldn't become only a discussion of, of economic development versus democracy. Uh, but Neil, nevertheless, I think you should have a chance to respond to this. And also, Neil, there is a question to you, actually, um, concerning whether you have any example from Africa where decentralization has led to uh, greater accountability to, con to constituents um, and to stronger influence of civil society on development issues. So perhaps you could uh, touch upon that uh, also in your remarks now. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, it's a fascinating discussion and I know we cannot go too far down there, but just to throw one factor in, because I think if we look at Denmark, sometimes it's said that 95% of the population are paying taxes and 95% of the population are receiving benefits. And in many African countries, we probably have a situation where 
15% are paying taxes and at best 15% are perhaps receiving benefits through, I don't know, education, health services, this kind of thing. So we have a very different situation. I just wonder whether or not that complicates this question about, uh, should we say authoritarianism and how to bring about change when you have a very weak financial element to the kind of social contract between citizen and state. And you have a state which is prim primarily being financed through very often natural resources, um, gas, oil, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it's just a dimension which, which strikes me as perhaps making it more complicated to bring about change because we see COVID-19 state failure, but where do you expect the state to deliver and on what basis and how would it be financed? I, I know that's complicating it further, but it's just to throw that into the picture. On the question of um, where decentralization has, has had a, a positive impact, it's very difficult to say because I think that there have been periods when there have been quite successful uh, should we say, um, programs for decentralized development, but mainly at a, a, a local level. There was, I mean, even in Uganda, uh, some 15 years ago, there was a very good decentralization program, which is being implemented using fiscal decentralization to strengthen local accountability. And if you compare that with the situation in Kenya, and constituency development funds, then you just get the big man distributing funds to get the votes he needs, because it usually is he, to get re-elected. Um, so it's very localized, it's very time specific. Uh, there isn't a general example I can, I can give um, in that sense. Okay, thanks. Um, I'd like to turn now or to focus a little bit on, on, on uh, the COVID-19 and uh, democracy um, and the changes taking place, uh, because there are two um, questions on, on that. Uh, one is uh, to you, Nick, uh, on, on um, Malawi, uh, whether you can elaborate a little bit on, on, on why there has been a, a positive democratic development during COVID-19 um, in recently uh, in that country compared to other countries. And then there's also a, a question concerning uh, the parameters to determine whether democracy has eroded during the pandemic in, partic in a particular country. Uh, how do we actually assess this? And, and you, so Nick, you also actually talked about the, the possibility of regimes to use uh, COVID to, um, to uh, hide a little bit other uh, issues that they would like to carry through. And is this a part of, of, of how we assess uh, the, the democratic decline? Um, so, uh, and, and if you could talk a little bit about that, Nick, uh, then uh, I think we should turn a little bit to the, to the civil society issue subsequently. Absolutely, and, and Sarah might want to come in and, and Morgan's because they, they provide a lot of evidence of the kind of decline in space for civil society, which I think is essentially a, a key way of you know, measuring democratic decline. But let me talk about Malawi because I'm very fond of Malawi and I spend a lot of time there and I was there during these events. And essentially what happened in Malawi was that the judiciary stood up to be counted. Um, the judiciary had been able to develop a stronger and more effective um, you know, capacity to hold the executive to account over a few years. And the judiciary in, in Malawi has, has occasionally played an important role in the democratization process, as has the military. And so what we had in 2019 was an election that the opposition said was flawed. The incumbent president won. Uh, the Constitutional Court agreed with the opposition and ruled that the president was illegal. That was the second time only that had ever happened in Africa. I think the fourth time only that had ever happened in the world. Um, there was then an election that was, re uh, the, the government appealed that decision from the Constitutional Court to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court then doubled down on the decision and said not only was it right, but that actually it was even worse than the Constitutional Court had said. So the judiciary really stood up to be counted. But around that time, a number of interesting things happened. And it turned out that the kind of gradual consolidation of independence of both the military and the judiciary meant that the government couldn't lean on either of those bodies to base allow it to manipulate the next election. It was also the case that Malawi has very stringent rules on who's allowed to be uh, the chief, the head of the Electoral Commission. And the he outgoing head of the Electoral Commission in 2019 had to stand down by 2020. So there was a new head. And in Malawi, you can only pick the head of the Electoral Commission from the judiciary. 
So it had to be a judge. So the government was constrained in who they could pick. And of course, the judiciary had been becoming more independent. So all of a sudden you get an electoral commission that's new, headed by a new figure who's a judge. You've got the military who refused to become involved and do the dirty work of the government. And the judiciary that's clearly signaling that if the election is in good quality enough, it's going to nullify it again. And it's in that context that you have a new election in 2020 where the government loses and the opposition wins. So people then feel that justice was done from the 2019 elections and it's a victory of the independence of key Malawian institutions, most notably the judiciary and the military. But underpinning all of this, and this is something that really connects to what Sarah was talking about earlier, was a mass civil society campaign. And after the initial elections were rigged, civil society groups in a group called the Human uh, Rights Defenders Coalition, HRDC, went to the streets of urban areas and refused to leave those streets until they got what they considered to be justice. And I think many people think that that campaign of civil society was one of the things that encouraged judges to rule against the government and to say that the election wasn't good enough. So it's a kind of process of institutional strengthening, but underpinned by really effective civil society mobilization. Now, it's important to say that doesn't mean Malawi has sort of made it to be a consolidated democracy. This was a particular moment when forces you know, kind of arrange themselves in a way to allow for a transfer of power. There were still major questions about accountability, about corruption, about legislation. There were still many battles to be won around gender equality and so on. Um, but for that process, that sort of shifted Malawi against the tide of all of the other systems that were perhaps moving the other way. In terms of the way, you know, the measures that we use to measure whether countries are moving towards democracy or not. I mean, for example, the graph that I, the figure that I showed you, the map of the world was produced by Freedom House and Freedom House produced a, a map, a, an indicator of political rights and an indicator of civil liberties. And each of those indicators has a series of sub indicators. So, for example, does the government allow freedom of expression? Does it allow freedom of movement? Does it allow et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And it has a series of people coding the quality of democracy on the basis of all of those. So if we see a significant movement, what it probably means is both there's been a significant decline in the quality of civil liberties. For example, the government has started to place greater infringements on the ability of people to be part of associations to speak their mind. Um, in Tanzania, for example, the government essentially has been increasingly censoring criticism of the president to the point where you can now be jailed for criticizing the president in public. It's those kinds of measures that are being picked up in these indicators and then kind of aggregated into an overall decline. So in most cases, you'll see something like a 20 point set of scale of indicators for civil liberties, sort of 20 point scale for political rights and measuring progress against each one of those over time. And that's what's creating the evidence that suggests that 80 countries around the world have had a decline in COVID uh, during COVID-19. Declining democracy so during COVID 19. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then I'd like to turn to, to Sarah um, because um, there are some questions uh, to civil society uh, issues, and I would also like you to perhaps start out by um, commenting on, on uh, Moons's point that that um, civic space can be uh, limited uh, for different reasons. Uh, there is a difference between West Africa, uh, um, Burkina Faso, Niger, um, Mali, the situation there. And then if we take uh, countries like Tanzania and Uganda, where it is a more uh, state uh, organized uh, limit, uh, limitation of, of civil society space. So um, do you think that there are differences that are important to recognize uh, when we talk about what um, civil society should do and can do? Um, I think that would be great. But there are also some questions which also are related to, to your presentation, Mons. So both Sarah and Mons uh, could perhaps think about this. Uh, namely, what kind of, of um, organizations can respond or organizational activities can respond to, to the current situation um, with uh, COVID-19? Uh, do we talk about uh, movements like ENSALs or do we talk about uh, other movements that actually can play a role in the given situation now? Uh, and should we focus um, our efforts more to, to support such uh, movements? And finally, a question on what can individual citizens actually do to protect civil uh, spaces and society? Uh, please, Sarah, would you start 
and then we go to Monge. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, firstly, on the different reasons for civic space closing, that's definitely the case. We see it not only on the African continent, but also in other parts of the world that governments have either um, anti-terrorism, fighting a pandemic, um, fighting bla blasphemy and, and, and other kinds of, of issues that are a threat to the national security or a threat to, to um, the country in, 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 in general. And these are then being used as arguments for closing down civic space. But we also do see different perpetrators. So it's definitely not only governmental actors that crack down on civil society, it is also non-governmental actors, whether it being uh, military actors or religious actors, or it even being you know, part of a, a broader um, a local um, um, issue of conflict. So for this reason, it's also very important to have the, the view on civic space as it um, having double layers of restrictions for some groups of people, whether you are a women human rights defender, whether you come from indigenous people background or LGBTIQ plus background, etc. Everybody is really facing these extra layers of restrictions, also very much dependent on the context you're in, such as in Uganda during COVID-19, we had um, targeting of LGBTIQ plus people uh, to sort of being put um, as uh, spreaders of the pandemic, right? So, so governments have really been using in different ways um, uh, the pandemic, but also other issues to crack down on those people that they would like to, to not have a voice in society. And just uh, shortly on the next point on the potential for change for African youth, I am really in awe and, and uh, very respectful towards those amazing social movements that we've seen all over the African continent. I think that African youth can teach us in Denmark so much we have seen how young people have really come together around causes and made a difference. They have mobilized in masses that we really have not seen recently in Denmark, for example, to the same extent. As an example, in South Africa, there's been an amazing movement uh, fighting gender-based violence. And I think very much the young people have been the forefront of this fight as well. Um, so I think the potential for change for African youth is immense. The change that they're able to, to bring to societies and we can learn a lot for them from them. And then lastly, what can individual citizens do? Um, a lot. So, so obviously sharing the stories, being active on social media and in their everyday life in um, being part of a conversation, but also just uh, putting attention to these cases that are happening around the world. If, of course, this is happening in one's own country, there, there's a lot of things that can be done with regards to trying to speak up in the spaces where it's possible, trying to get together with those that have the same interest as you to try to do something, whether it's then mobilizing, uh, pushing back on, on legal restrictions or other things. Um, but I think one person can do a lot and we especially see that in connection with the social movements and the mobilization on, on the internet. And in Denmark, there's also a lot of solidarity that um, and also just a co-responsibility and actions that we can take together where we as individual citizens have a voice and we're privileged enough to live in a country where we're not facing crackdowns and we should use that voice. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Monch, would you? Yeah. Take the floor. I think that Thank you. we have to think out of the box and not uh, identify civil society in a very traditional way as a number of NGOs or CSO. We necessarily have to have a, a broader view and we have to include a new social movement. Some of them are broader based, but you also have these groups of young people who are organizing specific actions. And I think uh, I think the Danish NGO, I think the CSO with whom they are partnering, they have to get out of the box and uh, try to establish new alliances, new coalitions and networks with, in some cases, with, with member-based action uh, organizations, uh, in some cases with uh, uh, faith-based uh, uh, organization to create a 
broader movement. I think what is what happened five, six years ago in Burkina Faso was quite interesting also to see how the more traditional human rights organizations, among others, they entered into these um, coalitions and networks promoting uh, a, a very important social and economic uh, political change. So this is, I think this is a challenge for the NGO CSO community that they have to get out of the box. Okay, thanks. We have to get out of the box. And that's perhaps also a note on which we should end. Um, I'd like to thank the, the participants for very good questions and also in particular the panelists for their presentations. Nick, uh, I'm very grateful that you took the time to participate in this uh, seminar, which has to do with, with a, a process in Denmark regarding uh, civil society organizations and their work in Africa. So uh, thanks a lot for taking part and um, we'll uh, end uh, this webinar here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.